you had a question uh, about the Joel 2 uh, passage. I haven't looked at that uh, ex I, really exegetically, and, uh, and so it's more uh, off the cuff. The preaching here of Peter, in, uh, where he quotes the Joel 2 passage about male and female servants, uh, God will pray out his spirit in those days, they shall prophesy. Um, it seems to me that uh, here uh, Peter is simply citing Joel as the eschatological uh, fulfillment of Pentecost, which is not again about office, but about faith. And even as in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, uh, you can have the language of prophecy used in a variety of ways. In fact, in the First Corinthians passage, women are certainly prophesying, uh, but they are not to speak in the divine service. And of course, that's often used as Paul either Paul contradicted himself or else the part about not speaking was some kind of interpolation. But I think, uh, uh, I, I think uh, he here you have to ask simply how is the word, how, how is a particular word being used? And the laleo, the speaking, it seems in 1 Corinthians uh, 14, is not just any kind of speaking, but this proclamation. So uh, women speak in the church, for example, in that women sing hymns, women participate in the liturgical uh, responses. And so it is not forbidding women to speak in the sense of enjoying absolute silence, uh, that uh, it is rather saying that women are not to have this particular office of speaking, this preaching office. And I would suggest in, 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 in the, the Acts 2, uh, Joel 2 passages, um, the context of Peter's preaching is not about people being put into the office of preaching, but people being uh, made Christian through the operation of, of, of the Spirit uh, in, in the gospel and baptism. And, and that here, male and female are baptized into Christ, and in that sense, they are prophesying. They are they are speaking. In the sense, uh, looking back again, uh, is it in Deuteronomy where you have that language of uh, would that all of God's people prophesy that there there is a, a speaking which all Christians are to, are to do, uh, and uh, men and women included. That men and women both confess faith in Jesus Christ, and they do that publicly in the words that they. In, in the words that they say. That's something distinct, though, from being put in the office which is responsible for uh, the proclamation of the gospel in the church. Does that... Uh, I, I, I just wondered, you know, I haven't read the book, uh, the, the, or, the Women's Ordination book, but I'm just curious, every time it comes up in the lectionary, I, I think to myself, boy, the women's ordination crowd, so to speak, must cling to this kind of a text to, to try to justify their their uh, their actions, you know, their their office. Mm -hmm. But my other quick, just quick observation I was talking to Ken about, that uh, it does say in that text right afterwards, the sun should return to darkness, the moon to blood. And Peter also mentions this in Peter, and he says, as you yourselves have seen, and apparently uh, there was a moon blood on the day of the cross. So this seems like this is already a fulfillment at the time of Jesus on the cross, mm -hmm. and yeah, if so, then Paul soon after, what twenty years later, is writing his prohibitions against it. You know, so even all of this would fall in line and say, well, even if so, either Paul is not consistent with the Old Testament, or else, like you said, it has nothing to do with the office. It has simply to do with the profession of faith in Christ. Yeah, and I think I, let's give Paul the benefit of the doubt that he knew uh, a little more about the Old Testament than certain 21st century exegetes and um, and 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 that he uh, yeah, he did not see it he did not see himself as inconsistent between 1 Corinthians 14 and, and Galatians 3 or between uh, you know uh, Joel 2 and presumably he would have known uh, the story of Pentecost okay uh, last hour today I want to uh, um, I'm going to move to questions of church fellowship because they seem to be uh, uh, important today, and um, and and certainly issues that uh, uh, that Sasa addresses. 
And then uh, tomorrow, I want to uh, look at the sermons that you're reading. And as, as we have time, also look at uh, Lord's Supper uh, and liturgy in Sasa. Again, as I said, we're by time constraint having to be somewhat um, selective here. But I, I, and I, I'll tell you what I told the class in Michigan where we had a whole week and still didn't finish the syllabus. The value of a class like this that kind of probes around in someone like Sasa is not that we're able to exhaust the depths of what Sasa has, has done within the course of a few days, but it opens the door for you to do some more reading on your own. And one thing I failed to mention yesterday and would mention uh, today with the upcoming anniversary of the Reformation 2017, uh, I think this book in particular could be quite helpful. One of the things I suggested to the brothers in Michigan is that uh, this book would be an excellent um, study piece for your circuit winkles at some point between now and the end of 2016. But yeah, here we stand, uh, because you're going to have, um, you know, I mean, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation uh, is going to be uh, an event. It's going to be observed. Uh, the secular press will observe it primarily by digging up all of the anti, anti-Semitic, allegedly anti-Semitic comments that Luther has made um, and all kinds of attempts to psychoanalyze Luther, uh, reminiscent of Eric Erickson's young man, Luther, and uh, various kind of portrayals of the Reformation. And when I was in Helsinki last summer and, and heard the LWF presentation, they specifically stated that they wanted to present the non-confessional Luther. Uh, they wanted to present, uh, present Luther uh, as this figure in kind of religious history uh, and capitalize on Luther for interfaith understanding and dialogue. And, uh, and so you're going to get all kinds of revisionist pictures of Luther and the Reformation. And I think it is incumbent upon us uh, who actually value uh, the confessional Luther to be able to articulate what we understand by Reformation. And this book would be a helpful kind of piece in uh, beginning to think through how we might rightly uh, uh, celebrate the Reformation in uh, 2017. I'm going to start with an essay Sasa did in 1957 on selective fellowship. Um, he writes this essay. He had visited the United States um, several times now uh, in the late 40s and 50s. And he is writing specifically uh, to a um, situation uh, with North American Lutheranism. So if you think of 1957, uh, the configuration of American Lutheranism, on the one hand, you have the synodical uh, uh, conference, which is still intact, but under duress. Uh, and the Synodical Conference would finally come to an end in 1959-60. Remember, I don't remember the... May have been officially 62. I think the ELS had left earlier. But it's... it's uh, the, the, the Synodical Conference is stressed. Uh, Synodical Conference would have included the uh, Missouri Synod, uh, the Wells, uh, ELS, uh, the uh, Slovak Evangelical Lutheran Church, which is now a district in the Missouri Synod, uh, and the uh, National Lutheran Church, which has a small uh, Finnish group. Uh, both of these groups would, after the breakup of the Synodical Conference, become part of the Missouri Synod. And so the ones that would kind of remain self-standing would be Missouri, Wells, and, and ELS. Uh, in the center, uh, you had uh, the um, 
old ALC and uh, the uh, old ALC would have been uh, consisted of a merger between the uh, Ohio or the Iowa, Ohio, and Buffalo uh, uh, synods and um, and and the um, Evangelical Lutheran Church, uh, the Norwegian body, um, and a um, uh, and a uh, a small uh, I think I got the initials right. Uh, this is the American Evangelical Lutheran Church. It's not the AELC that broke out of Missouri, but a Danish. Uh, small Danish body, and in um, in 1960, these will be all merge to become part of the uh, ALC, and and then over here you have the United Lutheran Church in America. Uh, you have the Augustana uh, Synod, the um, Sumi Synod, the Finns. And you have this, uh, I think it was United American Evangelical Lutheran Church. I might get the initials wrong. This was a, also a Danish group. Uh, these were the so-called Happy Danes. And these were the Sad Danes. Uh, the ALC, the old Danes, the, the, the Sad Danes were much more pietistic. Uh, the so-called Happy Danes were the Grunt Vigian Danes uh, who were theologically more liberal. Uh, but also not uh, as pietistic, and um, and and these bodies in 1962 would unite into the uh, LC LCA. Um, the Wisconsin left uh, the Synodical Conference in '63. No, yeah, it actually didn't dissolve until '67. Oh, right. the last okay. remaining um, Norwegian group in Missouri split. Okay, I thought it was earlier. I thought the, Nor the Norwegians left left earlier. But are uh, there two? What's that? Why aren't there two groups? I think so. Yeah, the um, National Lutheran Council or National Lutheran Church was finished. Maybe they stayed earlier because I know ELS was the first to leave, yeah. and when the ELS left, that put pressure on Wells, and and but by the time and and when Wells left, then it was basically all over, and ultimately these. These two just merged into, into the Missouri Synod. At any rate, this is something of the context. Now, remember, uh, these groups, in particular, the old ALC, had uh, always kind of saw itself as closer to the Missouri Synod in many ways than they did to the ULCA. Uh, the ULCA was seen as more liberal. And, um, and, and the old ALC saw itself as kind of a mediating, uh, mediating group. And, um, and in 1950, the Missouri Synod and the old American uh, Lutheran Church, and this was formed by way in 1930, um, had produced a common confession. And the issues of predestination open questions had at least on paper and lodgery uh, had been had been reconciled and in fact that was one of the reasons that the uh, synodical conference begins to stress is that there was a fear on the part of wells and els that the missouri synod was going to declare fellowship prematurely with the alc now you add to this mix what i was talking about a little yesterday the statement of the 44 uh, which uh, chided Missouri for an, what was seen as an overly restrictive uh, view of of church fellowship, and and so Sasa is um, is is riding with all of this in view. There is also another group that is put together uh, called the Overseas Committee, and. Uh, the Overseas Committee was a group of theologians 
from our sister churches, obviously overseas, who were attempting to help Missouri and Wells kind of come to terms with one another and preserve uh, a fellowship. And so uh, Henry Hammond from Australia was part of that. Um, there was, I, I think, uh, Esch from Selk in Germany. And uh, I think there was maybe Pierce from Great Britain, E. George Pierce. Um, and, and, and the so-called overseas brethren were really trying to help Wells and Missouri kind of mediate and prove to be ultimately uh, unsuccessful. But Sasa uh, has, you know, uh, has insight. He, he has contacts in Missouri uh, and ALC, old ALC and ELCA, or ELC, Herman Preuss was part of that group uh, in particular. And to a lesser degree, he has even contacts with Tappert and, uh, and, and, and Theodore Bachman uh, over here. One of the things that was being um, uh, kind of surfaced in, um, in, in the Missouri Senate in the 1950s was the practice that was described as selective fellowship. This is actually what Sasa is writing uh, against. The practice of selective fellowship basically would go like this. Even though the Missouri Senate and the ALC, in this case, are not in fellowship with one another. Let's say you are in a town and you have a congregation of the ALC and the Missouri Synod and pastors get to know each other and uh, the pastors discover that, uh, they're, that they share the same confession, uh, that they um, believe that the scriptures are inerrant, uh, that they understand uh, the gospel, uh, that uh, both congregations reject lodgery and so forth. Uh, why cannot these two churches uh, simply kind of have church fellowship, even though the church bodies have not yet uh, made uh, such a declaration? And um, again, Sasa wants to get people to think through more carefully the implications of decisions being made. Um, in other words, uh, it, it in many ways seems very attractive. You've got two congregations. Uh, you think of a small town in Iowa where kids from one congregation are marrying kids from the other, other congregation and they uh, are you know, moving back and forth. They can't go to communion with each other. Uh, or the two pastors know each other and study the scriptures together. and um, and, and see that they uh, share the same, uh, uh, the same, same faith. Um, so Sasa uh, notes in his essay that he is speaking here as a theologian and not a church politician. And he says, it's necessary to do this at a time when theology is in danger of becoming the tool for church politics. Sasa takes as a serious challenge the sad state of disunity among the various Lutheran churches uh, that bear the name Lutheran. He recognizes, in other words, uh, that these various church bodies ought to be united if they indeed are confessing uh, the same gospel and administering uh, the same sacrament in the way of AC um, and, and AC7. And as I said, he would work for the unity, the organic unity, the merger of the two churches in, in Australia. So he's not simply being uh, stubborn or saying that we ought not seek to uh, redress uh, the uh, the disunity that we uh, that we see here. He also recognizes that he is addressing an era in American Lutheranism that assumed that the church dividing issues among Lutheran bodies 
were a thing of the past. Uh, what, after all, had been some of the church dividing uh, issues? Well, but not, uh, language is cultural. Um, church dividing in terms of theological issues. Predestination and open question. And uh, um, open question was particularly the Iowa Synod. Uh, uh, building off of Leia, where uh, Leia uh, argued uh, that some aspects of the Lutheran confessions, particularly the office of the ministry, were open in that they were not yet completely developed, and that was also applied to questions of chiliasm or eschatology. Uh, and uh, uh, again, I said uh, in 19th century Germany, it was a big, the big question was the question of the church, but attendant to that question was the question of eschatology, of chiliasm. And what, and, and that came, well, that was transported from Germany uh, in, into, the United, in, into the United States. Well, this common confession of 1950 had, um, at least on paper, uh, come to resolution of those questions. Um, the old ALC, their doctrinal paragraph on Scripture was actually stronger than that of the Missouri Synod. The Missouri Synod, uh, Article 2 uh, of our Constitution, has never used the word inerrancy. Uh, the Constitution of the old ALC commits the church to inerrancy, specifically. It did. Uh, the, the Minneapolis Theses, where this was hammered out. And, um, and, and so it appeared to be that um, these bodies were moving closer together. Uh, remember that in the early part of the 19th century, uh, even over here, the left wing of Lutheranism is moving in a more confessional direction. I mean, the... Uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the 19th century, the conflict between Schmucker and Krauth, uh, with Schmucker's general synod uh, and uh, Krauth leading the general council, was a move toward uh, confessionalism on the part of Krauth. And, and in 1917, formation of the United Lutheran Church in America those differences had been resolved, and the ULC, uh, the ULCA, seemed to be moving in a more, uh, in a more uh, confessional, in a, in a more confessional direction. So, mid-century, after the Second World War, the assumption was that there would be one United Lutheran Church in America. Uh, sooner or later, preferably sooner. Now, again, Sasa writes, it's interesting to look at this 1957 essay in light of what he said in 1927, American Christianity, because he noted in 1927 that one of, uh, that there was a strong impetus in American Christianity toward merger, that bigger is, is better. And, um, and so he sees this, playing itself out. But he also realizes that um, statements adopted by church assemblies or church councils or church conventions do not always accurately reflect what is actually going on in the seminaries and in the congregations of a church body. And um, uh, and, and so he is uh, concerned as to whether the differences have actually been overcome by scriptural and confessional agreement, or if the differences are being ignored by a spirit of doctrinal indifference. One of the things I appreciate about this essay is um, that he 
makes the point that one cannot merely be confessional without at the same time confessing. Uh, he writes, and again, this kind of uh, bleeds a little over into what I want to do in the sermon tomorrow morning, uh, but a confession cannot remain a real confession if it is only inherited. It must be confessed. We can confess only if we are deeply convinced that it is the true interpretation of the word of God. Sasa asserts that Jesus provokes confession, provokes dogma, with the question in Mark 8, 29, who do you say that I am? And, um, and, and so uh, one cannot use the confessions as merely decorative pieces or as museum artifacts, or to use the words of the late Kurt Markwart, as ecclesiastical rabbit's feet. That as long as we say we're clinging to the confessions, it's like the person who's holding a rabbit's foot for good luck in his hand. And because we claim to be confessional, we must be confessional. At, uh, in a little different light, it uh, is reflected by um, what Mark Brown, a Wisconsin Synod theologian, who did his doctorate under uh, Ron Forhan at St. Louis, wrote in his uh, Tale of Two Synods, uh, Missouri and, and Wisconsin, that Missouri, he said, labored under, bur under the burden of infallibility. And it was basically because we are Missouri, we cannot fail. We are the Missouri Synod after all. Uh, we are the heirs of Walther and Pieper. And, um, and, and that, as Brown pointed out, one of the difficulties with the breakup in Wells is that the Missouri Synod was saying we've not changed. We are still the Missouri Synod. We can't change because we're the Missouri Synod. Uh, we, are, we have the confessions. We have the brief statement. We have Pieper. We have Walther. And yet, it was quite obvious to everybody else that the emperor had no clothes, that changes were taking place. <coughs> and Sasu kind of spots this. Uh, he spots it in a little different way in an article that he did about the same time on confessionalism in the Missouri Senate. It's published in the Cloa uh, Forhan book on scripture, Sasu and scripture in church. Um, and he's uh, there uh, kind of diagnosing and examining what is going on in post-World War II Missouri Synod uh, Lutheranism. <laughs> and he, he, he wonders if uh, perhaps the, it, it's not simply that these old doctrinal differences have been overcome, but maybe they're just being ignored. And... Um, in the um, essay, uh, he laments a serious study of the confessions. And this also interfaces with his uh, essay on confessionalism in the Missouri Synod uh, that I mentioned just a moment ago, uh, where he, when he looks at uh, the statement of the 44, he notes that they never even bothered to cite the confessions in making their argument. Uh, that it, they're just oblivious to the, it's not that they re, outright reject the confessions, they just don't uh, try to make a statement on the basis of, uh, of the confessions. And he worries that uh, in the Missouri Synod, uh, the confessions are given lip service, but being ignored. Uh, and he also faults the brief statement in this regard, uh, that the brief statement uh, became kind of a, reworking of the theology of Pieper, but not uh, really developed out of a serious study of the Lutheran uh, confessions themselves. And so in this way, Sasa is kind of speaking of, uh, to both sides of a developing controversy in the Missouri Synod, which as I said yesterday, would make him a rather uncomfortable kind of persona, uh, that he is not a man simply given to one party in 
the church. He sees himself as theologian, uh, you know, of the church and for the church, and 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 wants to uh, uh, to 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 call uh, uh, the church to faithfulness on the basis of scripture and confession. Uh, and because there is a lack of serious study of the actual confessions, Sasa says it is. Is this not perhaps the deepest reason why we find no doctrinal differences any longer where our fathers found them? Uh, Sasa goes on to say maybe the reason that we find no doctrinal differences to be pressing anymore is that we haven't bothered to look, uh, that we really need to look more deeply uh, uh, in, into the confessions, that we cannot simply assume that with the passing of time uh, these uh, uh, these errors have been addressed. He moves then to talk more directly about the conceptuality of of what was being called uh, selective fellowship, and he diagnoses this as an unhealthy congregationalism that would bypass the synod and see the establishment of fellowship as a matter of individual congregation, congregational right. In other words, he sees selective fellowship as actually creating more disunity, that each congregation uh, would then kind of see itself determining its own uh, practices of fellowship without regard uh, to the other congregations in the Senate. And so he makes the argument in the piece on selective fellowship that the New Testament knows nothing of isolated congregations, but always of congregations bound together. So that with the uh, Pauline correspondence in the New Testament, uh, there is a connectivity between these churches, uh, that there is a um, um, apostolic greeting uh, given and received, uh, you know, prefiguring what Werner Ehlert will uh, later call the letter of peace, Eucharist and church fellowship in the first four centuries, uh, that church fellowship was not a matter simply of what an individual believes, but was determined on the basis of which altar one is connected to. Uh, and our practice of a letter of transfer is really kind of an outgrowth of the letter of peace, that uh, someone is commended to a congregation that uh, participates in this same, uh, in this same uh, uh, confession. S Sasa writes uh, that uh, the Catholicity of the confession in space and time would be destroyed if the church body which confesses magno consensus, Augsburg I, with great un un unanimity, were atomized and pulverized into a mere aggregation of individuals or small groups. In other words, selective fellowship would not further, but rather destroy the unity of the church, of church, of the church bodies. And this means that measure of unity which had already been attained. And so that uh, Sasa does not see selective fellowship as a step forward, but a step backwards. Remember, he thinks it's a good thing if churches, church bodies that are actually in theological agreement with one another come into fellowship. But Sasa's basic point is that churches ought to be slow in declaring church fellowship, and even slower in breaking it. And that if churches rush in to declarations of church fellowship prematurely, they will find themselves uh, oftentimes in positions where it is necessary to break it. It's kind of in, in that sense, I guess, something like a marriage uh, that you want to look before you leap. Uh, you want to make sure that you can uh, actually uh, live with this woman, this man, and uh, uh, and 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 that in in church fellowship, 
uh, Sasa is actually advocating kind of long courtship. Uh, but again, uh, one of the things you see in Sasa is there's no need to rush. There's no need to rush. Uh, the church has a future. The church has time. Uh, and he's worried uh, with the kind of the urge to merge that he sees in American Lutheranism as, as being uh, premature. And remember, he's writing in the 1950s where there was a heck of a lot more commonality between these churches. I mean, a hundred times more, a thousand times more commonality between these churches than the current ELCA and Missouri Senate. I mean, you know, we've talked in the Missouri Senate about the Missouri Senate and the ELCA being on divergent paths. In the 1950s, you would see American Lutheranism really moving toward a kind of convergence. Uh, and, and Sasa was aware of that. He's not against that, but he wants, especially in the case of the Missouri Synod, because the Missouri Synod he thought had the most to lose, that, uh, that the Missouri Synod would, would, would work with caution in uh, entering into church fellowship. He makes a couple of other um, uh, uh, comments here that I think are helpful and important uh, just in terms of what fellowship, uh, church fellowship means. Um, he notes that our English word fellowship does not do justice to the richness of the New Testament word kononia. And I think we see that. I mean, we talk about having a fellowship hall or having a fellowship hour after the divine service, or we're going to enjoy some Christian fellowship over uh, you know, parish picnic or whatever. And if you're talking about fellowship in those terms, then it is downright un in inhospitable uh, to say we're not going to have fellowship with this local ALC church down the street or in the next village. Uh, but he's he's probing again and 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 pushing uh, that we might understand what Kononia fellowship actually is. And so he writes, since the days of the apostles, the practice of communicatio in sacris has been regarded as that which really establishes church fellowship. Altar fellowship is church fellowship, 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17, and vice versa. Uh, that for Sasa, there are no degrees or levels of fellowship, that church fellowship is fellowship in the sacred things, in the preaching of the gospel, and in the administration of uh, the sacrament. And just by way of um, of a footnote here, um, Zasa's colleague at uh, at uh, Erlangen, uh, uh, Werner Ehlert, uh, wrote Eucharist and Church Fellowship, and um, and that would have been written by Ehlert while Sasa was at Erlangen, and actually uh, Sasa and Ehlert uh, had a, a a lot of conversation. Uh, uh, kind of, I think, mutually uh, enriched each other's approach on 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 this matter, and um, and the um, uh, Eucharist and Church Fellowship by Adart is really important also uh, for understanding uh, uh, Sasa, especially if you look in Adart that opening chapter where Adart uh, contrasts Luther's understanding of church fellowship with that of Schleimacher, uh, basically making the case that in modern Protestantism, Schleimacher has triumphed and, uh, and that people have so much trouble uh, with, the, with, with what we call church fellowship or altar and pulpit fellowship because they're, they, they, they're basically operating from the mindset of, of, of Schleimacher. And, uh, and, and for Schleimacher, uh, it is... Uh, the church is simply an expression of a larger category of fellowship. And for Luther, the church is constituted in a particular kind of fellowship. 
uh, the fellowship in the gospel, in, in the holy things, uh, 1 Corinthians. And so, uh, so here there's overlap between, uh, a lot of overlap between Sasa and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Elert. Uh, 